Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at Netflix. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with Netflix. If you're not, they're kind of like the leading streamer um, in video content. So, you know, watching TV shows and movies at home um, over your computer, smart TV, iPhone, iPad, anything like that. Uh, as of April 16th, trading at $546 a share and a $242 billion market cap. So in this video, I'm going to go through a DCF I threw together. I will have a longer series coming out actually tomorrow. Um, so I guess that would be 420 on Tuesday, 420, um, where I go in detail about how I kind of pull this whole thing together. There's been a lot of questions lately about some of that. Um, so I figured I would just record a longer, longer form video going from kind of starting at reading the 10K all the way through. But um, this is more of the summary video, just to kind of see what we get uh, for Netflix. So first thing, right, pulling the income statement. Um, net income, 180 million to 2.7 billion. So definitely a lot of cost here uh, in comparison to revenue. So that that is a big concern and we'll touch on it here in a little bit. Um, but right, I mean, net income is 2 billion, almost 3 billion and you're valued at 250 million. So we'll, we'll touch on it, but then pulled some information from the cash flow statement. So their COGS number actually includes amortization of content assets. So we will back that out. Um, but then there's additions to content assets. So this is really them, you know, they pay cash up front to either develop, produce, or license TV content, movies, shows, etc. And then they amortize it over the life of the, the contract or what they consider the like peak viewing times of the shows. Um, and then they have a little bit of traditional DNA and PP&E, but nothing too material in comparison. So, I mean, as you can see, right, the the additions to content assets has historically been over, I mean, this is almost 100% of revenue, um, right? So it's almost been 100% of revenue historically, and then now revenue is really kind of supercharged and it's dropped in half. But anyways, first thing we need to do is forecast out top line revenue. So. What we've done here, they gave us two views of revenue um, or of, I guess, users per se. So that's what we're gonna look at. There's, they gave us by country. Um, so US and Canada, EMEA, LATAM and APAC. And then they gave us just like a, a high level picture as well. So what we've gone ahead and done here, um, I calculated the number of households in the world. Um, and for this, I took the population of the world and divided it by five because that's the average household size. I mean, this isn't scientific. It's just to give us a rough estimate of how many users are on the Netflix platform. So they have 203 million paid users at the end of 2020. Um, so if we're assuming every household has one membership, about 13% of the world is on their platform. So the reason why I pulled this in is because we're going to want to look out here right at 2030. Um, pulled an estimation of the population, it's 8.5 billion um, divided by five, that's 26% of the, the world's population. So we have it about doubling um, of those who joined Netflix. And really what we did here is the user growth rate, you can see tremendous user growth recently, um, but really it's not quite as significant as it looks here. Um, I mean, with COVID, right, They definitely had a peak of subscribers. Everyone was stuck at home for a year. A lot of these people in a non-COVID year probably wouldn't have subscribed. So I have us regressing back kind of towards um, some of the, you know, numbers from kind of pre-pandemic. So average there was 24.06. So that's exactly what we set this to. And we've just held this flat. So another reason we looked at it this way is they actually talk about new new user ad growth. So looking at the year over year growth of new users, right, from one year to the other. And we can see right in 2019, it was actually down, it was up here, up here. But, you know, it's, you know, they hover around somewhere in the 20s. Um, so, you know, we'll say they can add 24 million users a year. And, you know, you kind of model that out. What does it get you at the end, right? On the total base number, you have 440 million users up from 203 million today. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably fair. You could probably do some more analysis in here. I know they're cracking down on 
like people that share memberships, things like that. Um, but from there, we'll forecast out the revenue now. So streaming revenue, and then they still have a little bit of DVD revenue, but it's been decreasing 60 million a year. So I just have that decreasing and then going away. I'm gonna guess that's not a part of the business they wanna continue to support. It's probably low margins and it's probably more of a hassle at this point in comparison to the traditional streaming, but you know they may keep it on just for some of the legacy customers um, just because. So what we have is we have streaming, streaming revenue per customer, and then we have revenue per month. Um, so this is just the streaming revenue divided by 12 to get kind of an idea of what the, the monthly membership would cost. So here we've just left everything flat. So no, no price increase, which is probably, um, you know, they, they will increase prices over time. But this is just kind of a baseline and it gets us going from 25 billion of revenue in 2020 up to 54 billion. So this is kind of our first base case scenario or high level scenario. And if we go over to our DCF here, right, we can see how this kind of models out. And, you know, this model is gonna look a little weird. So we add back content amortization because we want to neutralize out the impact of DNA. Um, and then we subtract COGS, but this COGS line actually includes content amortization. So, you know, you probably, I probably should have just had COGS be one line and had it been um, the difference of these two, but I have them both in there, download the model, you can follow along, right? And then SGNA, um, R and D gets you your EBITDA. From there, add, subtract depreciation and amortization, subtract amortization of content, get you your EBIT, taxes, right? And then add back DNA, add back amortization of content, subtract CapEx, and then subtract purchase of content, and that's gonna get us our cash flow. So the reason why we had to kind of neutralize the content piece is you can see, right, like they amortized 10.8, but they bought 11. Eight, so really a billion dollars more impact to the cash flow um, going the wrong way. And in 2019, right, it was a four billion dollar impact, almost five billion. So if you, you know, if you didn't back this out and you didn't factor this in, you would be drastically understating their cash flows, right? You'd have them have a positive cash flow here of two and a half billion, then here it'd be three and a half billion. When in reality, it's that's not the case. Um, they are purchasing content. So the big thing that I think is hard to get comfortable with on this page is the purchase of content. So I've looked at it as, as an amount of revenue, right? And it's, there's that aspect. And then I just kind of also looked at the general numbers, right? And I have more years worth up here, nine, nine, or I guess it's like eight, six, 10, 13, 14, 12. So, I mean, really, you know, I think this is a tough one to really try to, wrap your head around. And I don't know enough about this, but if they can support 200 million users at $12 billion of content a year, they can probably continue to do that. Um, and they're probably not gonna have to double the cost of content. And I would think over time that, you know, this number may actually decrease. I think that's the big unknown for me. Um, and it's probably the assumption if you're looking at current levels, right? Um, so the way I forecasted this is I just took prior year and then had it grow at half the growth rate of sales growth. Um, that way sales is growing faster than content, but you know, I'm assuming some form of content has to continue. Um, another thing you could do, right? If you were to just set this steady state and say like, oh no, at content, right? It's a lot of in-house content. You know, that's good, right? Um, 130 billion is what you get here, but if you look at our sensitivity, you get from 84 to 253, just depending on what whack you pick as an individual. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's a little bit of a tough one um, to really wrap your head around. And, you know, I don't know if a content library that's 10 years old that they developed, right, is Stranger Things 1 still gonna bring subscribers in 2030? Probably not, uh, but they own that and there's no content cost to it anymore because they just, they developed it themselves. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of going forward how this changes, but as long as they're having to in license a lot of content and then develop a lot, I think this number is going to stay growing similar to revenue. Um, so this was kind of the, the first picture, right? And you can go through and look through all my assumptions. The next version we did is based off the country level, very similar thing we did in the first one started with, um, new member ads. So for this US and Canada, and I did a similar thing. I calculated the number of households now. I didn't, I couldn't find good 
like household population data for 2030 for these. So I just kind of held it constant. But right in the US, we have them going from 55% of households to 77% of households. And, you know, that might be high, might not be high. Um, my thought here is as kind of the older generation, um, I guess as the younger generation comes into being independent, they've grown up on the internet and technology, they're very comfortable with these things. More of them will become users. Their parents are already users because they're in the household. So I think you will see this number probably um, increase in the next decade. And then I also had the membership cost increase 7%. So I think in the US, they are gonna be able to be aggressive on pricing, right? We've already gone from 11 to 13 in the last two years. I think they're gonna continue that. And I think the US consumer will continue to pay it, especially as we cut the cord on other services. EMEA, we go from 30% to 57% of households. And similar, we have them growing the revenue, but not quite as aggressive um, at 4% a year, as opposed to 7% here. LATAM going from 29% to 57%. So, you know, very similar growth of how many households I've assumed compared to EMEA. And then the price, I have it just growing at inflation at 3%. Um, I think, you know, until there's a, a bigger value prop with a lot larger um, content library for international users and in foreign languages um, might not be as easy to, to raise the price. And then APAC, you look at the household, you might think this looks low. That's because I've backed out China. They're not in China. I don't know if they'll ever get in China. If they get in China, right, the completely changes this model. My assumption is if there's going to be any company that's going to have streaming content in China, it's going to be regulated by the Chinese government because they kind of want to regulate what goes in front of their um, people, which, you know, is what it is. So I've backed China out of here, but we have APAC going from 4% to 14%. And then same, just growing this by inflation. So in this version, right, we go from 30 25 billion to 75 billion um, as opposed to 25 to 55. And we look at this one, right? We actually get um, a much stronger valuation. Um, so I think looking at the country level, you know, you can make more kind of informed assumptions on how many individuals from each country will get there and can they actually change the price? Whereas this one is just high level, right? We didn't have the price going up, right? Like we could have done, you know, maybe if we actually have this going up by 3% a year, you know, you actually get to a similar 72 versus 75. Um, so, I mean, and then from here, right, now you're actually closer. So, I don't know. I, I think the country level is better just because you can kind of control those factors a little bit better. Um, but very similar, made the same assumptions for content, just half of revenue growth, um, I believe. No. I have it half of revenue growth for first couple of years, and then I have it tapering off. So in this scenario, I was like, hey, look, after a certain point, they're going to have a large enough fixed ass, like fixed base of content um, where like, you know, you're never going to have to spend $20 billion a year developing content. It's going to be, you have this massive library that you own that you've developed, and then you spend $10 billion a year to in license half and then develop your own. And then you have this great content library, probably something similar to Disney. Um, right, they only have to produce three or four blockbusters and a couple TV shows a year, and then they just have a massive library of Disney classics that people will pay for. So someday Netflix will be there. Um, and when they get there, I think you will see the content price go down. But in this scenario, right, just kind of depending on your WAC, 118 to 361. Obviously, 6% WAC is pretty low, but um, I think, you know, in this scenario, 8% WAC, 192. I think you're still a little bit shy of. Um, right, 240. Um, so, I mean, it is a little bit low, but let's see. I mean, the pandemic has definitely helped them, right? If we look back pre-pandemic. So I guess the question is like, pre-pandemic, they were trading at 375. So you'd take what, 20% off the market cap, trading at 200 billion, if I'm thinking of that right. Take 40 billion off there, right? 10% is 24 billion, so. Yeah, they're trading at 200 billion, probably a lot closer. So I guess I would assume there's probably expectation that um, user growth is going to stay strong, similar to pandemic levels. So, you know, if you were to do something like this and just say, it's oh, it's only going to drop. Um, it's going to slowly regress back to the three. Um, let's do it like this. Right. And then you're like, they're going to have way more users and... Um, 
at least in the US, and then this one will do this one minus 0.5, right? Until we get back to like the, the sixth level, right? And then you're at 80 billion in revenue, um, 200 billion. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I, th I think you could play with the numbers and, and get to that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an interesting to, to look at and think about. And I think the, the content is really the, the interesting aspect that, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable around my assumptions here. I would think, um, you know, I, I just need to read a little bit more. I think about it would kind of look at maybe what Disney's content costs every year, um, things like that and see like, is this reasonable or is this just like insane investment right now? that's going to pay dividends for the next decade. And this number is really going to, because that, that's the big thing, right? If we have this dropping um, a billion a year, oops, I just have to add it. If you have this dropping a billion a year um, until it's like, I don't know, 3 billion a year, right? I mean, you start getting a lot closer and depending on how you sensitize, you, you definitely get there. So um, I think this is the, the key to, um, the valuation is just really how much is the content going to be over the next decade and do they need to sustain these large investments in content or do they have the library and do they have the licensing agreements that extend far enough out where that's actually going to drop so anyways thanks for tuning in love to hear your thoughts or comments below um, if you have any questions let me know